Hey, um, we've been talking out of Philippians chapter 3. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. I'm going to have to put the glasses on. I'm trying not to. Philippians 3, 13, 14. And the Apostle Paul, we've been talking about forgetting things for about the last four or five weeks. Uh, we're getting close to wrapping that up. We might wrap that up today. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, Brothers and sisters, I, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Uh, the it was his chasing heart after Jesus. He wants to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering, being conformed into the image of his death. But he says, I haven't got there yet. I'm not quite there yet. Who's not there yet? Anybody? Okay, there's about eight of us not there. This church is so confusing. A couple of weeks ago, nobody, like now seven people have made it. And a couple of weeks ago, I said, who hasn't made it? And about three had. I'm confused. But anyway, Paul himself, that's who we're focusing on. Paul said he hadn't made it yet. He said, but one thing I do, and he says this, he says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. That, that, that word straining in the Greek, it means uh, if, if you grabbed every fibre of your being and there was something in front of you and you were, you were stretching with everything possible in the direction of that thing, straining your muscles, straining your body, your tendons going after that thing. That's what this word means. It, it, it's, it's, it's not just a passive, casual, oh, I'm just going after this thing. If I land there, wouldn't that be great? I, I hope I can get to know Jesus. That'd be awesome. But you know, if I don't, this is, you're putting everything into it. He's putting all of his energy into trying to know Christ. That's what that word straining means. He says, forgetting what's behind, I strain toward what is ahead. He says, I press on toward the goal. The goal is to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We've been talking about forgetting things, letting go of things, because there are some things in our past that we need to forget. There are some things in our past that we need to make the, the choice wrestle with, whatever we've got to do. There are some things you just have to let go of. You can't hang on to them. As long as you're hanging on to things from your past, then those things will also hang on to you. And the starting point of letting go of those things and forgetting those things is making a choice, a decision to go, you know what, I'm going to actually release my grip on that thing and let go. That's the first place that we've got to go when it comes to letting go of our past. We've been talking about uh, different things. We've been talking about uh, letting go of our past sins. And we covered that a few weeks ago. Some of us are still haunted by and dragged back and, and, and feeling like we are that person that did that stuff. And, and we need to let go of past sins. We talked about letting go of past hurts. You know, some hurts will find healing and restoration this side of heaven. There are some things in life that we're not going to get the healing and the restoration we want this side of heaven. We will get it. One day we're going to leave this body. We're going to be with the Lord. And all that stuff will be, won't even be a distant memory. It'll be gone. But right now, there are still some things and pains and things that pull us back to the past that we need to choose to somehow let go of. We can't continue to be restrained by those things and captive to those things. We talked about our past reputation, letting go of our past reputation. Sometimes we, we, we can hang on to this individual reputation. It's so important for us to understand that you'll never know your true identity in Christ until you embrace your true identity in his body. Amen? Amen. Some of us want to, be, we want to be Christians, but we want to distance ourselves from the body. I want everyone to know that I follow Jesus, but I'm not like all those guys. And we keep ourselves on the outside of the church. You'll never fully embrace your identity because your identity is found in Christ. And Christ has a body called the church to truly understand and comprehend your identity as a follower of Jesus. The Bible talks about there's one body, many members, many callings, uh, many functions, but we're all still attached and joined together. And some of us want to be prosthetic limbs that can just take ourselves off and then put ourselves back in when we feel like it. But a prosthetic limb doesn't add any, anything to the body. There's nothing flowing from that limb to the rest of the body. It's not adding anything to the rest of the body. It's just a prosthetic limb. It can come off and be attached and so on. And some of us, people in the church, we're like prosthetic limbs. We just want to pop in when we want and we don't want to have to contribute anything to the body. And we certainly don't want to get anything out of the body. We just stay far enough away. Maybe we judge and we criticize the church. We're pointing fingers. We can't wait till somebody falls. And we're the one that passes the rumor mill around. Oh, do you hear what that person, see what they did? Oh, it's not right. If we want to find our true identity, we've got to get past our past reputation and find our new reputation, our new identity in Jesus. I want to move on this week, and I want to talk about the next one, a uh, thing that we've got to forget. Before we do, who loves... There's this saying that young people have. It's called like an epic fail. Anyone heard that? Oh, it's an epic fail. Yeah? It's, oh, we need some younger people in the church. Um, epic fail, right? So an epic fail is when something is meant to do, be really good, but 
in hindsight, it's like, eh, that actually didn't go exactly how I planned. I love epic fails. I, love, I don't like the ones where people are hurt, but, you know, somebody's walking along the street and they're looking at someone they shouldn't be and they bang into a pole or something like that. Anyone like that sort of stuff? Or, you know, they're riding their push bike and, and you know, trying to be cool or something and, and not paying attention up the back of a car. And I mean, they're all okay. They're not hurting themselves, but I love the, watching that kind of stuff. But one of my favourite epic fails is I love Googling uh, epic tattoo fails. Um, so I want to show you a couple of fails I've come across recently up here on the screens. Uh, think you see that one? No pen, no gain. <laughs> so anyone got a pen on them? Well, you're gaining something, but if you don't have a pen, there's no gain, people. Take that one away with you. Next time you go to the gym and the gym instructor says, push, push, I want you to go, that's right, because no pen, no gain. That's an epic fail. What's the next one we got there? I'm awesome. <laughs> Obviously, he doesn't mean I'm an awesome speller. Just, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. What's the next one? Don't let the past make your decisions for today. <laughs> decisions. Anyone notice something funny with that word? Don't let the past make your decisions for today. Uh, obviously, in the past, you didn't learn how to spell decisions, so it played into today, didn't it? What's the next one we got there? Believe in yourself and never lose hoop. Okay, that's all you got to do. Now, I want you to imagine, these people have got that on their body now, you know? Then people are probably going, praise God for that laser surgery that takes it off. But I'm telling you, what a great saying, believe in yourself. Who, any, is yourself here? It sounds like a person's name from, from a Middle Eastern nation. Believe in yourself and never lose hoop. Never lose hoop. Kids, remember that, never lose hoop, all right? Okay, you need hoop. Hoop's an important part of life. And this is getting to where I want to go today. Regret knowing. Okay, I'll bet you that person's regretting something right now. And that's the fact that they can't spell nothing. Uh, next one. No regrets. Okay, no regrets. Imagine that across your chest for the rest of your days. You didn't say, oh, okay, I've got no regrets, people. I've got no regrets. And finally, the last one. No regrets. Okay? You know what? And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about forgetting your regrets. I mean, your regrets. I mean, your regrets. Forgetting regrets and letting go of regret in life. Many people struggle through life, dragging behind them the chains of regret. Anyone got regrets in their life? Anybody look back and there's things in your life that you regret? You regret, you wish you could change, but how many of you know what happened yesterday happened and I, unless they invent a time machine where I could go back in time and change that event, that thing actually happened and I can't change that. And so there are lots of different regrets and many different chains and forms that regret comes in in life. We can regret things that we did. Anyone regret things they've done? We can regret things that we didn't do. Sometimes we can be in regret of things we didn't do. We can, we can regret things that we said. Or we can regret things that we didn't say. Ever, ever, anyone ever been to a, a, a funeral and you're standing there and you hear all this amazing stuff coming out and, 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 and you're there thinking, oh, I hope that person, I hope these people had a chance to say that to that person while they were still there, but often we don't. Often we don't. We stand there and we speak at a funeral or we look at a gravestone and, and we speak words and so on, but, but, but often it comes with uh, this attachment of regret. I wish that I had have said that a different time when I could have. We can regret past failures, things that didn't quite work out. We can even regret past successes. You know, if, if you, there was a, a survey done of lottery winners, people that bought lotto tickets and won squillions of dollars, and then within 12 to 24 months afterwards, most of those people, a high percentage of those people, are in debt worse than what they earned. And, and they've been interviewed, and some have said, you know what, I wish I'd never won the money. I regret winning the money. So we can also regret past successes or things that have happened that are good in our life. We can live with regret over those things. We can regret wasted time. Who, who, feel, who regrets wasted time? Looking back at seasons of your life and living with this regret that, geez, I, I could have done something different or better with that time. I wish I had been more productive. Or I wish I had done something, you know, instead of doing nothing. Or I wish I had done nothing instead of doing so much time doing something. We can regret wasted time. And we can regret missed opportunities. We can regret not exercising. We can regret eating too much, spending too much money. Um, we can even regret the fact that we were born into a family and had to follow the West Tigers, and we had no say in that because my grandparents did, and that's all I knew. Wish they were Storm supporters, but there was no Melbourne Storm back then. So, 
So we all live with regrets, and we all know what regret is, because every one of us have felt regret, or probably a high percentage of us right now is still feeling regret over things. So how do you define regret? Let me give you a simple uh, Oxford Dictionary definition of regret. Regret is this. Regret is a sense of disappointment over something you did or failed to do. It's a sense of disappointment over something you did or didn't do. This, this sense of disappointment, this knowing that I can't go back and change that thing. And it's almost like, to use a popular phrase, it forever haunts me. It forever haunts me. It follows me around. This sense of regret. Regret's an internal response that we make to what we would personally consider as a past mistake. It usually is attached to something that when we think about it, we think that that thing was a mistake. That thing was a mistake. And the thing about mistakes is sometimes mistakes are real. Who's made real mistakes in life? But guess what? There are also some things that we think are mistakes. I'm going to pray for you, brother, up the back there, shaking his head. Never made a mistake. There are also some things that we think are real mistakes, but sometimes they're actually just perceived mistakes. And maybe they weren't mistakes, but we think they were. Paul wrote a fairly scathing letter to the Corinthians, uh, in, 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 but we don't have a copy of this letter. So when you read Corinthians in your Bible, you've got First and Second Corinthians, but uh, most uh, theologians would deduce that there's probably been about four letters that were written to the Corinthian church, and some of them we don't have copies of anymore. And in, 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 in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul's speaking of a letter that he wrote that, that was somewhat scathing to them. He, he went after some things that were going on in the life of the church and so on, but, but he talks about their response, and their response was a really good response to whatever the challenges were or the issues that he wrote to them about. And he says this in, in 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. He's contrasting these two types of sorrow, and he says one type of sorrow walks you away from this thing that people live with called regret. The other one walks you to this thing called regret. One of them walks you in the direction of this thing that he calls life, and the other response walks you towards a thing that he calls death. In this little passage here, Paul links this, this, this image, this picture of regret with a picture and image of death. And that's kind of what regret does. Regret is something that it eats away at us, and regret in our past is something that tries to kill the potential of our future. It tries to hold us back and kill the potential of the future. We can feel godly sorrow for the mistakes we've made, and this will produce life and distances us from the chains of regret. But worldly sorrow keeps us chained to regret. God does not lead us into regret, but God leads us out of regret. That's what Paul is saying. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. In other words, godly sorrow points us away from regret. If it is God recalling our past, it's always going to lead to life. But you know it's the enemy when the fruit of those recollections are death and regret. We know it's the enemy at work. See, God never condemns me for my past he sets me free from it. Amen? He doesn't condemn me for my past. He sets me free from my past. John 3, verse 16, we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We know that, but sometimes we stop short and we don't read this verse after that. For God did not send his son into the world, verse 17, to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him, that the world might have life through him. So Jesus doesn't come to condemn he came to offer life. He came to bring life. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul writes these words, and we all know this scripture. Therefore, there is now, right now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're here in this place in Christ Jesus right now, you have a relationship with God. You have repented of your sins. You've turned your life over to God. You are walking daily following Jesus. If that's you, then what he's saying here is that there's, you don't need to have condemnation in your life. You don't need to put up with condemnation. You don't need to play with condemnation. Jesus told us to go into all the world, and he told us to go and preach the gospel to all nations, but there was one nation he said don't go to, and that is condemnation. Ha, ha, ha. Stay away from condemnation. So here's the thing. If God's wanting us to distance ourselves from regret, and I believe he does, then all I want to do in the time left, I want to give you four thoughts that hopefully will help you let go of regret and hopefully help you move forward into the purposes of God for your life. Four simple thoughts today that I want to throw at you. Number one, regret is not a sin, but it is a weight. 
Okay, regret is not a sin, but it is a weight. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. The writer of Hebrews tells us this. He says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he's just listed all these great men and women of God and the trials and the testings and the tribulations and the things they went through, but the point is they stayed their course. They kept moving forward, even in the midst of all of this. And he says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, or in other words, because, because, I've, because of all these examples I've just given you, because we've got so many people that have gone before us that are a great example to us. He says, let us throw off. Who's throwing it off? Us, we are, that's right. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and regret might not be a sin, but regret hinders. Regret's a weight that holds us back to the past. And, and, and the writer here to Hebrews encourages these people, throw those weights off. You've got to let go of that stuff in the past because God has great things up ahead for us. God has great plans and great purposes, but so many of us are being held back from that because of things that have gone in the past, can't be changed, can't be altered. They've happened, but they've got their claws in our back and we're, a company, we're helping them because we're grabbing them by the wrist at the same time and allowing it to pull us back from the great things that God has for us. And we've got to throw these things off, these things that hinder us and slow us down and stop us moving forward. It's not a sin. Uh, Regret is not a sin, but it definitely is a weight. So you don't need forgiveness for weights. What we need is encouragement to throw them off, don't we? We need to be encouraged to let go of them. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. He's saying that we, 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 if we look around, we're going to find that there are a whole bunch of other people out there that have probably been through similar things to us, probably got the same regrets, trying to claw them, trying to hold them back, but they have been able to overcome those things. Be encouraged that whatever regret you're facing right now, I'll guarantee you this, you are not the only person to ever struggle with this regret. Now, I know at times, we, at times when, we, when regret is so deeply ingrained in us, we can. We can feel like nobody understands. We can feel like we're the only person that's ever regretted that. Let me tell you something. Every parent in this room has regrets about the way they raise their kids. Every single parent in this room can look back and go, I wish I had her, I wish I should have, I could have said I could have. Every parent, you are not alone if you're a parent here and you have regrets about that. You're in great company with a bunch of great people. But you know what? We've got to throw that off and we've got to walk forward into the, into the call of God. Amen? If you're married here, a husband or a wife, or if you have been married and maybe it didn't work out, or if you're in a relationship, or maybe you had a relationship but it didn't work out, here's the thing. I'll guarantee you, both sides, everybody probably has some sort of regret over something they said or did or didn't do or didn't say or the way they behaved or whatever. We've all got regret in those spaces. But guess what? You're not alone if you've got regret there. I bet you there are people here happily married who still have regret. I wish I could have been a better husband. I could have been a better uh, uh, wife. I could have been a better whatever. We've all got that kind of stuff. We've all got that kind of stuff in our life. But we've got to learn to throw that stuff off. We've got to be courageous enough and bold enough to let go of that stuff so that we can walk forward into what God has for us. We don't need forgiveness for weights. We need encouragement to throw them off. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying to these people. He's encouraging them. Others have gone before you, fought these battles, gone through these tough times. They've probably had regrets and all kinds of things too, but they've come out the other end. So be assured you're not the only person to ever feel regret. And you're certainly not going to be the last one to feel regret. And here's the good news. You won't be the first person to choose to let it go if you choose to let it go. You won't be the first person but you'll become one of those examples that the writer of Hebrews talks about. They'll be saying, hey, you know what? I know you got this regret, but look at this person over here to the right. Look at that person over there. They had the similar things, and they, but you know what? They let it go, and look, they're moving on forward with God, and they're making the most of the life. Life is a gift that God has given to us to enjoy. And these things hold us back and don't let us do that to the full. The writer of Hebrews tells us where we should be looking. He says, don't look at your regrets. Don't look at the stuff of the past. He says, what we should be looking at is not past mistakes. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. I don't know about you. I don't think Jesus is sitting back in my past mistakes. I don't think Jesus is sitting back in my parenting mistakes. I don't think Jesus is sitting back there in my financial mistakes. I don't think Jesus is sitting back there in my poor choices. And I don't think Jesus is sitting back there in the mistakes I've made as a husband. Jesus is up here calling me follow. He's calling me follow. Amen? 
And that's what I want to do. I want to commit my life to following. And if I'm going to follow Jesus, then he's out in front of me. I've got to keep my eyes out here. Because here's what happens if I'm following someone. If I'm following, following you and then I turn over here to look at that and then you turn right and I turn back and I'm like, where is he? I feel lost. I'm trying to keep my eyes ahead as much as I can because I just want to walk with Jesus. The author and perfecter of my faith. That's what I want and that's what the word of God encourages and that's what Paul's saying. I've I got one goal. I just, I, there's one thing I'm chasing after. I want to know him. I want to know him. And anything that gets in the way and slows me down from knowing him, I want to deal with that. I want that stuff out of my life. Paul tells us that he's come to realize that the only way to live effectively as a follower of Jesus, as he said in Philippians, is forget what's behind and strain toward what's ahead. Second thing, second word of encouragement, hopefully will help you to think about letting go of some of your regrets, is this. If you are spending time in condemnation, then make the decision to get out. Make a choice. Make the choice to let it go. We already know there's no condemnation for those in Christ. So if there's condemnation hanging around you for your regrets and mistakes of the past, you know it's not coming from God. You know it's not God putting that on you. It's coming from somewhere because it's very real, but it's not God. So to let go of it and to resist it and not believe it and not trust it is not rejecting God because God's not putting it there. It's actually the step of faith that I believe God wants us to take because he's not putting that stuff on us. He's not putting that stuff on us. And sometimes, sometimes we want to get in a prayer line and have someone pray for us and have all the work done when somebody lays hands on us. Anyone like that? I, 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 I just want the work to be done by, by some really holy, anointed person. I'm sorry, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm striving to get there. But, you know, maybe we'll go and find a more holy, anointed and, 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 and superior person and they'll lay their hands on me and, and all of a sudden all the work will be done for me and I won't have to throw anything off because their prayers will rip it off me and I'll just dance into glory, but there's so much in the Word of God that says, no, no, we've got a part to play in this here, people. Amen? We've got a part to play in this journey. Salvation is a free gift of God, but growth in the Lord we, takes a little bit of effort on our part. Yeah? I wish someone would just lay hands on me and pray and every, every Bible verse was in me, and I could just go, blah, 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 blah. I wish I could do that, but it hasn't happened. And I've had some great people pray for me. I've rolled and laughed and done all those things over the years since I got saved. But guess what? I've still got to pick up my Bible and read it. I hate that. Just pray for me, you know? I just want to be a, a, a better husband to my wife and a better father to my kids. And so I just want someone to pray for me and I'll just be the best husband and the best father. Just pray for me. And when I get up from prayer, I walk home and my wife will go, What's happened to you? You look like the greatest husband there's ever been. And my kids will go, Dad, there's just something about you. You're now the best dad ever. And then I open my mouth and they go, oh, got it wrong. And I'm like, back to the drawing board. Pray for me. Now there's stuff that we've got to do. Amen? We participate with God. We participate in this journey of life. We make good choices and the Holy Spirit empowers us to follow through with those choices. He doesn't overpower us. He empowers us. He empowers us. So if you're spending time in condemnation, please make the decision this morning, I'm going to get out of it. I'm going to make the choice to let it go. And, and, and God will direct you. You make that decision this morning. Here's what I know. The Lord will direct your steps as you walk it out. He will, he will direct your steps, but you've got to make the decision to walk out of condemnation. Jesus never said, go into there. He never said, go into that nation. He said, flee that nation and stay away from it. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 10 says this. It says, do not say, this is apparently the wisest man that ever lived wrote this. So you can take it or leave it, but you know, apparently he was very wise. Um, Solomon said this, he said, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it's not wise to ask such questions. It's not wise to ask such questions. He's saying, don't live in the past. It's really not wise to just keep living in the past. It's not wise. It's not the smartest thing to do. Keep in mind, Ecclesiastes, it's not, it's not promises, it's wisdom. And the thing about wisdom is you can take it or you can leave it. It's like Proverbs. It's a book of wisdom. Okay? We don't hold them up. Oh, this is the promise of God. No, it's wisdom. And wisdom is something you take on board and you apply, or you can choose not to. It's your choice. God's going to love you either way. But my, what I've learned in life is if I come across wisdom, take it. Because life pans out just that little bit better when I take wisdom on board. He says... Do not say, why were the old days better? And I would say, do not say, why were the old days not good? The point is, don't look back there. Don't look back there. Don't spend your whole life looking back there. Move forward. Third, 
a uh, word of encouragement I'd like to give to anyone that's struggling with regret is this. You need to believe that good can come from your mistakes. Even if you made mistakes, things that you regret in life, you need to, as a believer, trust in a God that could take that mistake and make something good out of it. Amen? I mean, if, 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 if this whole journey was purely of my doing, I would be a basket case right now with the amount of mistakes I've made. I'd be sitting in the corner, sucking my thumb in the fetal position. And I would probably do that all day, every day, because I would be overwhelmed with, with the, 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 the reflection and the amount of things that I'm embarrassed about, that I did wrong, that I didn't do right, that I could have said, that I didn't say, that I should have. Like, it would be way overbearing for me. But here's the thing. I actually believe, I actually believe that my life has been surrendered to a God who knows that I'm fallible, knows I'm human, knows I make mistakes, and isn't putting it on me to make my life this grand, awesome thing. All he's requiring of me is just, would you just follow me? And if you follow me, I will lead you. I will guide you. I will guide you. I, 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 I will get you to that place that I want you to be. If it was all up to me, I'll guarantee you. Uh, yeah, people think about the will of God. Some people think the will of God is like the eye of a needle. Let me tell you something. You will never, ever fulfill the will of God for your life if it was all about you. You'd never get there. You'd never get there. Think about it. Every single thought, every decision, every choice, every turn, every place you went, everything would have to be pinpoint accurate. But thank God for his grace and his ability to take even our wildest mistakes and turn them around and somehow make something really, really good out of those mistakes. Anybody remember the story of Joseph? We all know the story of Joseph, yeah? Um, you know, Joseph, Joseph made a mistake. If you're a young brother or sister here, it's a mistake to sit down your, 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 your other older siblings and tell them, one day you're going to bow to me. Just learn from Joseph. Don't do it, all right? It was a silly mistake and we all know the story. Uh, his brothers were, they, they were offended at him. They didn't like him. It wasn't just because of that, by the way. If you read the, the text earlier on, it says that Joseph, uh, just his father loved him more than his brothers, and that's what made them angry. If you're a parent, don't show outright favoritism to one child. It's not going to end good. So anyway, we all know the story. Joseph ends up uh, uh, being sold into slavery and goes off into Egypt. And one day he's second to Pharaoh and he's controlling the food bank in Egypt. And all these people are starving and, and the family comes and his brothers come. And eventually, you know, he, 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 he basically saves them. And it turns out that that little dream that he had, that one day they were going to battle him, guess what? It actually did end up happening. But here's the side of the story that we really think about. What about the mistake that the brothers made? Those brothers were saved by a mistake they made. They were the ones that threw him in a pit. They were the ones that sold him. The brothers did that. So the brothers actually, it was the brothers' mistake of doing all the things that they did. In the end, their very mistake, God turned that around and used it for good and saved them. I don't know. I, 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 to my natural human mind, I go tilt, tilt. I don't quite get how God could do that. But when you look at the story, they made a mistake and their mistake was the thing that in the end, God used their mistake to save them and to save their family. It's a pretty awesome thought. And uh, it actually reminds me of Romans 8, 28 that says this, and we know that all in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Whatever that thing is that you're regretting, you know what? You've got to bring that to the foot of God and say, but God, you know, even, look, I, I might regret that, whatever, but I'm going to bring that to you, Lord, and I'm going I'm to place it at your feet because here's what I know. Looking back, I ain't going to change it. It's not going to do anything good for me. It's not going to do anything good for the kingdom. But if I bring that to you, God, I know this. I trust you, God. You can work all things together for good because I love you. Yeah, I shouldn't have done, I shouldn't have said, I shouldn't have been, I wish I could have that time again, I wish I could. But God, I know that you can take all of that and I know that you can work it all. Somehow, God, you do this thing and you work all things together for good. God's working things together for good because when you worked it out, it probably wasn't good. That's why God's got to get involved. Go, Let me make it good. You know, here we go. It's like a, uh, you know, a, a, a little pottery thing or something you know kids are making the little pottery thing at school and you know it's meant to be a bowl and it looks more like a you know i don't know map of the world or so it's just pieces here you know and, 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 and but you know the teacher comes along and the teacher goes well, i'll help you you know because the expectation is that the, they're not going to nail it the kids are not going to nail it they're not going to make it perfect so the teacher's there knowing i'm going to get involved in this i'm going to make this into something good and god knows our fallibilities god knows who we are but, but we rest in faith, knowing that by the grace of God, he can take all things and he can work all things together for good. That's the God that we believe in. That's the God that we read about in this collection of ancient documents, Patrick, that we call the Bible. Somewhere in the sovereignty of God, we have to believe that he does truly 
have the power to take my mistakes and turn them into something good. So I, I, I think some of us struggle with that. We love the scripture. Oh, God works things all things together for good. But when you attach that scripture to your regrets, do you really believe it? Do you really believe it? I think a lot of people don't. I think a lot of people don't. So instead of moving forward and looking for the good that's coming up ahead that God's got planned for their life, they're still sitting back looking at that regret. And the devil's loving it because he's rubbing his fingers together going, as long as you're looking backwards, you're not looking forwards. As long as you're looking over there and Jesus is moving over there, this is not helping you walk with him. And you're not going anywhere. We've got to let go. Number four, real quickly. Fourth word of encouragement I want to give you. And this is really important. Give yourself some grace. Because it most likely was not a mistake at the time. Give yourself some grace. Let me tell you what regret does. Regret takes a magnifying glass and places it over that perceived or real mistake, whatever it is. Regret takes a magnifying glass and puts it over it. And as each day goes by, it seems to magnify it. You think about the incredible regret you have now about something that happened 10 years ago, yet in the moment, you probably didn't feel as much regret at the time. When you were there in real time, that regret probably wasn't there. It's a beautiful thing about hindsight, isn't it? Hey? Beautiful thing about hindsight. But, but regret puts a magnifying glass over those issues, those things, and makes them seem so big and so overwhelming and almost paralyzing because we feel like, well, how can we ever move forward? How could I ever... Some people are sitting there going, I was a terrible parent. No, you were probably a good parent. You were probably not perfect, but you were probably pretty good. You most likely did the best you could with the knowledge that you had at the time. But here's the problem. The knowledge you have gained since then is now being used against you by the devil. But you didn't have that knowledge back then. Regret. Some people are sitting here going, I should have known that that relationship was not going to work. Well, why should you have known that? Here are the facts. The facts are you probably got on really well in the beginning. You were probably truly in love or felt like you were in love. You probably entered into that relationship with the best of intentions. And this would be forever. But something happened along the way. But don't beat yourself up. You weren't stupid. Some people ever hear people go, oh, I was so stupid. I shouldn't have. No. Go back to the moment. You weren't, you weren't, doing, you weren't back in the moment going, I'm gonna, this is going to be really stupid, but I'm going to marry her. Oh, no, it's going to be really stupid. No, no, no. Go back to the moment. Think about it. Have some grace on yourself. Have some grace on yourself. Go back to that moment, that, that, that moment that the enemy's causing regret where he's holding you back. Go back and be real about it. Think about it. Something happened on the way, so don't beat yourself up. You were probably very much in love or thought you were very much in love, but it didn't work out. Have grace on yourself, please. You know, I should have been smarter with my money. If I was smarter with my money, it wouldn't be where I am now. That's probably true, but you probably didn't know what you know now about financial management. That there's a lot of things in life that, that, that hindsight's this beautiful thing, but, but the, the thing what the enemy would like to do is grab all that beautiful hindsight and use it against you and turn it into regret and go, why didn't you know that back then? Hey, we got married at 23, right? There are a lot of things that we did not know at 23 when we got married. And I've got, there's plenty of room for regret in the way we manage conflict. Plenty of room for regret in, 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 in things that I, I can say personally I did or said or whatever. Um, um, there's plenty of room for regret in that stuff. But if I go back to 23-year-old me, who came out of a broken home, who'd just gotten saved, you know, three, four years earlier, didn't really know much, uh, had never had any responsibility really forced upon me, I never had boundaries put in place, kind of like, like if I go back, I, 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 I go, you know what, I did a really good job. <laughs> With the knowledge I had at the time, I think I did okay. Have some grace on yourself, people. Have some grace on yourself. See, people grow. People mature, and it's unfair to judge your past decisions based on your current level of understanding. Don't do it to yourself. It's not fair, and God's not doing it. In other words, don't judge your past self by comparing it with your present self. If all things have gone the way they should, that your present you is way better than the former you. Amen? That the present you is smarter than the previous you. The present you is more emotionally in tune than the previous you. The, the, the present you is a lot more uh, uh, realistic 
maybe than the previous you, a lot less idealistic than maybe the previous you. There's a lot of differences between who you were and who you are now, and that's normal and healthy because we grow and we learn and we mature in life. So don't judge your past self by comparing it with your present self. If everything has gone the way it should have in life, your present self wins hands down. You're always going to regret everything compared to who you are now. See, hindsight is a gift that helps us learn from the past. Regret's an anchor that keeps you tied to the past. And you've got to let some stuff go, people. Regret is like the devil's leash. It's his way of keeping you on the path that he has set before you. And it's a path of death, destruction. It's not a path of life. Regret ties you, to an un- it ties you to an unchangeable past. And in the process, it holds you back from painting on the fresh canvas of the beautiful future God has for you. Hanging on to regret is a form of self-punishment. People, it's a form of self-punishment. Stop punishing yourself. Stop punishing yourself. Paul's last letter he ever wrote was 2 Timothy, before he was beheaded. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He said, I fought the good fight. Think about this. This is a man, this is a man that has a bit of a checkered past. This is a man that, 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 that led people off to death because of their faith. This is a man that caused a lot of calamity and destruction to Christianity in its early formational years. Please don't think that Paul, because we've got this super apostle, please don't, please don't think these people we read about in the pages of these ancient documents. Remember, remind yourself they're real people, not characters in a, in a novel. They were real people. If they're real people, guess what? They would have battled real problems. They would have had real emotions, real feelings, and real issues. And I think Paul, probably at times, and I think part of that is in this Philippians where he's saying, look, there's one thing I've learned, people. I've learned one thing forgetting what's behind I press on because if I don't forget what's behind there's so much stuff back there that's going to hold me down because I've done some things and I've said some things and I've seen some things and I've been some things and I just got to press on and that's what God wants he wants me to press on forward and here's what Paul says the last letter that he writes before his death he actually says I fought the good fight he says I've finished the race and I've kept the faith that to me sounds like a guy who learnt to let go That sounds to me like a guy who had let go of the regrets and let go of the stuff in his past that was trying to hold him back. He must have overcome his own regrets to say this in the last letter that he wrote before he died. I might get the musos to come on back. I want to finish with that um, uh, Raise a Hallelujah song. We've gone a couple of minutes over what we would normally go. Sorry about that. See, one of the greatest lies you can ever tell yourself is this. If I had have made this choice instead of that choice, my life would be better. Anyone ever said that to themselves? If I'd have made this choice instead of that choice, my life would have been better. If I'd have married someone else, my life would have been better. If I'd have not got married, my life would have been better. If I'd have taken that job, my life would have been better. If I'd have not had kids, my life would have been better. If I had have had kids, my life would have been better. If I'd have done X, Y, Z better with my kids, my life would be better. If I'd pursued that dream, my life would be better. If I'd started up saving money sooner, my life would be better. If I started, we, we, we got all these lists of things that we could go on with. And it's a lie. It's a great lie when we tell ourselves, if I had have just made this choice instead of that choice, my life would be better. The only thing we actually know is that it would have been different. You don't know it would have been better. You just know it would have been different. So stop torturing yourself with some unverifiable fantasy of what your life could have been. People, my life is what it is. Thank you. My life today is what it is. I don't want to live in the past because I can't change it. And here's here's what I know. God's got great things up ahead. Amen? God's got great things up ahead. I've got to let go of some stuff. And regret is a big one for many people in this room. And I want to challenge you this morning. Let go of your regrets. Sometimes sometimes we, we feel like there's something really holy in hanging on to all that stuff. Like it makes us more spiritual. Because I, I'm agreeing with God by hanging on to it. You're not agreeing with God because Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago to wipe the slate clean for you. Hanging on to all that stuff is not agreeing with God. Hanging on to all that stuff is not being in step with what God has done. If you're agreeing with God, you'd let go of it because he dealt with all this stuff. And we walk forward into the freedom and the life that he has for us. See, people who second guess everything in their past, they never fully enjoy God in the present because they live every day with question marks. They've got uncertainty about their ability to follow his spirit. Uncertainty about his favor and his love. Uncertainty about, am I really in the will of God because I've got that thing. If I had done that, I... They live with question marks every day of their life. 
Here's the truth. Settle the issue. You've made plenty of mistakes in this life. Hang around a bit longer. You are going to make a lot more. How do I know that? Because perfection is an attribute of God, not of man. And perfect foresight is an attribute of God. We tend to live in the blessing of hindsight. Don't let the enemy use hindsight to create regret and hold you back. On May chapter 6, on May chapter 6, on May 6, 1954, a man named Roger Bannister. Everyone heard of Roger Bannister? First man in history to run a mile in less than four minutes. Within two months of that, there was a guy called John Landy and he eclipsed that record by 1.4 seconds. On August 7 of the same year, the two met together for a race. And as they moved into the last lap, Landy held the lead. And it looked as if he was going to win, but as he neared the finish line, he was haunted with this question, I wonder where Bannister is. And as he turned to look, over his shoulder to have a look where Bannister was, Bannister took the lead. He won the race. A reporter from Time magazine grabbed Landy after the race and interviewed him and was talking to him some time after. And Landy said this to him. He said, if I hadn't have looked back, I would have won. Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize that God has called me to in Christ Jesus. Nobody can walk backwards into their future, people. You've got to forget what's behind before you can strain towards what's ahead. My challenge for you is this. What do you need to forget? What do you need to forget in order to run forward and to win? What have you got to forget? Have you still got past sins that you've got to forget? Have you still got past failures that you've got to forget? Past mistakes that you need to forget? Are you still clinging to an identity that's not the identity that Christ is calling you to? What is it that you have to forget? Do you have regret in the background of your life? Things holding you back, but you have to forget. Because unless you forget and stop looking over your shoulder, you're not going to run forward into everything God has for you. Let's stand together. Here's what I want to do this morning. We've been, we've been dancing around these couple of verses for about five weeks now. We can go to church till the cows come home. We know that. I don't know what that means because I've never seen cows coming home. But we can go to meetings all our life. We can read the Bible all our life. There's a point of decision that God works in. God works in decision, moments of decision. And we've been talking about forgetting and letting go of things. Here's what I want to do this morning. These guys are going to lead us in a song. We're going to open up the front. We would love to pray with some people this morning. If there's stuff that you just know, you just know, I've just got to let that go. Just the very act of making the decision is the starting point for the Holy Spirit to get involved in that. Justifying to yourself why you don't need to is exactly what the enemy wants. I don't really need to let go of that. Yeah, that regret, there's something, it's healthy to hang on to that or, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep taking myself back and being held back by that sin because it, I'm proving to God that I agree with him that he's holy and the sin is bad, so I'm going to treat myself a certain... It's, it's not healthy. So we're going to open up the front this morning and if you like prayer, I'm going to encourage you to come forward for prayer. But here's the other thing and everybody, if you come to church here, you know this, there's nothing more holy or anointed about our leadership's hands. But if your faith's at that point where you feel like if the leaders pray for me, I've got faith that, well, hey, we'd love to pray with you. But let me tell you something. The person sitting to the left and the right of you, if they know Jesus Christ, they have within them the same spirit. So if you don't want to come up the front, why don't you grab somebody here today and say, hey, look, I want to, can you pray for me? Can you pray with me? I'm making this decision today. I'm letting go of some stuff. I'm letting go of some stuff because I want to win. Amen? I want to win. If you need to go, feel free. Like I said, we've got a few minutes over what we would normally go today. Thanks for hanging around. If you need to leave, that's fine. Uh, through the side doors there, we've got tea and coffee and so on next door. So feel free to go in there and make a tea and a coffee just near where you entered up there. There's doors to the side. Go on in there. Uh, have some fellowship, chat, catch up with some people and so on. But I just want to pray for us and then whatever you feel to do, you go ahead and do it. These guys are going to lead us in a song. So Father, I want to thank you for your presence in this place today, God. I want to thank you, Lord, that you... God, God you, you have a future for us, Lord. Your word tells us that you have plans and a future. And God, the future speaks of up ahead, not behind. And so, Father, I pray for each person in this room today. If we have things that we have to let go of, Holy Spirit, would you speak clearly to us today? And, and would you give us the nudge we need to take that step, that first step, of opening up and sharing with somebody and, and getting prayer and being honest and going, you know what, I'm going to let that go. 
And God, I know for a lot of people here, it may feel very uncomfortable and it may even feel arrogant for some people to think they can let that go. They may feel like, who am I to let that go? Well, God, remind them who they are. They are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And Father, we commit this next week into your hands, Lord. We pray as we leave this place today, God, would you give us an opportunity to tell somebody about the goodness of God. God, there are people all around our community. They do not know the gospel. They do not know about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. Would you give us the opportunity? God, would you give us the blessing of being able to share that good news with somebody in the next seven days? Thank you, Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.